So one of your grades will be reflecting, reflected on what you make on uh, the paper on Cosmos. This is a three credit hour course and with quality points. If you get an A, you have 12 quality points. B would be nine. And so uh, this, I believe, is an elective for you. I don't know that it's part of the actual course that you must take this particular English Bible course. It's not a Greek course. It is an English Bible course, but we will be using Greek uh, as well as a little bit of Hebrew as, it, as it's important. The stress is placed on the mastery of chapter content, exegesis of the epistles, and an analy analysis of the theological themes in John's gospel and epistles. Special attention is devoted to the doctrines of Christology and soteriology. Now the student will learn the standard introduction material for John's Gospels and Epistles as well as the chapter content for these four books. They must be able to identify the key theological words in John's Gospel and Epistle. They will analyze the different views of controversial interpretation in the books. Each student will develop a chronology of the key events in John's Gospel and make a sermon on John 19.30. The students will also write a paper on the significance of the word cosmos in the writings of John. And then we have below uh, the different textbooks, and we have spoken uh, about that. Uh, as to the grade, uh, students for some reason are interested in that. It's a straight scale, A, B, C, D, E, and F, 10% scale, and... Uh, You'll be, you get 50 points for the chronology of the events in John's Gospel, 50 points for the sermon on John 19, 100 points for the exam on John's Gospel and Epistles, and 100 points for the paper on the significance of cosmos in John. Okay. Now, there is one question that comes up when it has to do with your paper, such as the bibliography or the end notes. What is the form that is used? And there are different patterns that are out there. When I was a student, we used a form. Uh, the man's name who wrote the form was Campbell. Every year he came out with some changes. So every year you had to buy the new textbook of Campbell. And when I did my dissertation, the professor asked, well, which Campbell are you using? And he had half a dozen of these on his shelf because this, you know, to make money, you got to keep changing the form. So they switched at uh, the university I went, and then we, when we started here, began using Turabian, T-U-R-A-B-I-A-N, I believe, Turabian. So that will be the form. So if you give me a bibliography, that is the form for your entries in the bibliography. If you do an endnote, it would be a footnote in most papers, but I'm asking for endnotes, uh, use the form for footnotes or bibliography entries. Use the form that's found in Turabian. Right. Now, he has a little different design for the paper. I think it's an inch and a half in the left margin and an inch in the right. I just say use an inch all the way around. Uh, I want you to double space. Those are my instructions. Uh, but having said that, when it comes to a footnote or bibliography, if you don't use his form, it's wrong. That's what I will be using. Now, when you get out in the ministry, you'll have to do something. Whether you use Turabian or someone else, you have to use something. The, the key is being consistent. So that when you put a s title of a book in a certain format, you do that all the way through. You're going to give the copyright. And if it's uh, revised copyright, you're going to have that too. If it was something, especially for us, uh, many of the books we have were written in the 18, 19, or 17 or 1600s even, 1500s even. And you're not using that book. Yet in your bibliography entry and in, in your footnote, you're going to say the original was such and such, 1572. But your copyright is going to be Baker Bookhouse, who has put it out. And they have copyrighted it now in 1964. So you actually have two copyrights when it was first written, the book. And then uh, that's, that's important. Now, where you put that in your bibliography entry will be dependent upon what form you use. And obviously there's no right and wrong in that. 
the consistency is the important thing, that you do it the same every time. For us, there is a right and wrong. It's called Turabian. So if you don't have Turabian, you all knew you were supposed to use Turabian, right? Do you know about Turabian? The surname comes first uh, in the in the bibliography, and uh, brackets, commas, full stop. Exactly. They, they are different. So the footnotes will be the same throughout for footnotes, and the material will be found oftentimes in a different place, or it will be bracketed differently in the bibliography. Uh, that is true, and even the way you indent is different. All right. In the, in the bibliography, the first line is, is to the, all the way to the margin, and then the line after that is indented, and the line after that is indented. And then the next bibliography entry is different, where in a footnote or an endnote, you indent with the first line, the, and you give your data, and then you give your uh, comments. But the same material is in both the bibliography and in the footnote for the most part. Your bibliography do, usually doesn't give page numbers as the footnote will. And so whatever data you have for the bibliography, you will be using that data to write your footnote, but the actual form is different. So that is uh, understood. So that's why we say use Turabian, because he gives an example uh, of all kinds of different bibliographies and all kinds of different footnotes. And if your book is part of a series, that's going to be a different way of writing it because you're going to have to mark that this is part of a series. If your if your book is a, a later edition of some other uh, 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 writing, as it were, it was written, in, as we have said, in, in 1605, then obviously you are probably using a, a, a printing of that book back in the 1900s or this century. And in using that, the, the copyright material number will be different. The data for both the footnote and the bibliography, as far as the data concerning the book, will not change, but it's not going to be written the same way. It won't be the same order necessarily. Uh, and the way that you indent is actually reversed. Uh, so look at the form. If you have questions with that, see me, and I'll help you work through it. All right? Uh, you don't have to turn in something wrong uh, on the bibliography or endnotes uh, when it comes to form. I can help you with that. Uh, but you will need to use Turabian. And they have pages. Now, I assume the modern Turabian also deals with something that I never dealt with. And that is uh, the computer and s notes that you might get off the computer. Uh, I am not sure how all those are written. I have to go and look at the modern Turabian to see how they do footnotes when you're actually sourcing a, a uh, what do you call it on the Internet? Uh, a, website. a website, yeah. And you're, you're going to the website, and you're, that becomes your documentation, not necessarily a book, but a website. As I said, there was no such thing when I was going through school. Now there is, so all that has to be documented. If you use a website, you not, may not, but many of these books are on websites, and you could obviously scroll through them on the website. Um, so we will have to work through some of that. I'm lenient when it comes to that. But if you're not using the form of Turabium, I'm not lenient with that. If you're doing things differently throughout I'm not lenient with that. The main thing on a bibliography and footnote is that whatever form you use, you be consistent and do it the same way all the way through. In this case, there is a form that I'm making you learn. It's a good one. You can use it all your life if you want, but you must learn Turabian. As I said, when I went through, the author's name was Campbell, and uh, Turabian's a lot better in the sense that it hasn't gone through so many changes itself. Every year there was a new Campbell, new changes to bibliography and footnotes. Well, Turabian has only gone through a few changes in the last 20 years, and, and that's good. So does that help or no?
Do you have access to Turabian? Yeah. Okay. So that's what I'll be using to grade. And, uh, the format of the bibliography and the photo is different. Sometimes when I was typing the photo, I, I would mix them up and there, there were some mistakes when I was typing the photo. That, that's right. They, they are different. And, uh, but the form of the footnotes is always the same for footnotes. And that form is always the same. And the form for bibliography is always the same, but you can't mix the two. You can't mix it. You take the data from, from both of them, but you cannot change the forms. All right? And, uh, and in a, I don't think you use IBID in, in your bibliography. You use that in your footnotes. All right? If you're using more than one author or if you're re referring to a quote more than once. So we'll be, we'll be following that of, of Turabian. I know that students coming from other countries have used different things and their forms are different. And so just to be consistent, uh, to make it easier, uh, with two students it's not so difficult. Uh, if I had 20 students, uh, it's much more difficult if everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. <laughs> and uh, So in this case, as a seminary, we're using Turabian. So if you master Turabian in this class, it's going to help you in every other class. If you've already mastered Turabian, then this will be a piece of cake. Uh, at least that part of it will be all right. So this is, this is the grade, 50, 50, 50 for chronology, 50 for sermon, 100 points for the exam, and 100 points for the significance of cosmos in John. There are 300 possible points, and then you have the scale broken down in a 10% uh, fashion. Okay? Any questions at this point? Well, we are going to start then uh, our lectures. Trying to find out how to get back to the... There we go. I will give you these lectures. I haven't printed them out at this point, but I will give you a copy when we actually... Uh, well, after this class, I'll go and copy it. I spent uh, time learning something of the computer uh, uh, just a minute ago. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And uh, actually what we need to do is, is begin our introduction material. And I just skipped over it. Let's do this. Let's go first and, and make sure there's no questions on Hendrickson. Uh, these are the words for uh, studies that you're going to be doing. These are page numbers according to my volume. I'm assuming they're the same as yours, but I could be wrong sometimes. Very good. So we're okay that way. Uh, when I first taught this course six years ago, I was using a different Bible program, and I had to go back and edit some of the spellings because this program that I'm using now, a better program I'm using now, uh, doesn't use the same keystrokes. So I'm hoping that I've got all the bugs worked out and I have it all spelled correctly. If you should catch a word that's spelled incorrectly, just let me know. Uh, as you're going through, each one of these words are going to appear in, in, in Hendrickson. All right? So these are the words from Hendrickson. And uh, some of these words are the original form of the word, like oida or genosco. Some of them, like the first words you have, it is a word that is uh, probably the aorist, ex a ge sato, uh, that's probably aorist. Uh, I say probably, sometimes you have transitions that take place in the, in the verbs. But most of them are straightforward as you would look them up in a dictionary. But I don't want your dictionary rendering, I want Hendrickson. Even if Hendrickson is wrong, I want Hendrickson. So on the, uh, if I'm asking you on an exam, what does this word mean? I'm asking you, what does Hendrickson say it means? He might be wrong. Part of your education is learning some of the men when they're wrong. So with Hendrickson, I'm uh, wanting you to know what he says these words mean. You may, matter, you may want to write a little bit down if he has a paragraph on the word. 
uh, some of the things that theologically are important to that word in the context. Okay, so volume one, volume two, I think that's pretty straightforward. Uh, I have given that to you uh, in a digital form, right? That's what Chuck did. So that may make it hate helpful. You might want to just type on the page now rather than write it all out by hand. Uh, so I'll do the same for F.F. F. Bruce. Uh, give you the digital form, and then you can answer his questions and your space and give yourself some space there. And he will have also, I also have a section for words. But there are actual questions coming from him. Questions on that? We're okay. Uh, you don't need to see the exam yet. Let's start in the lecture number one, and then we'll come back and look at the introduction material. Uh, lecture number one, and uh, as I said, I will be giving this to you in a printed form. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and was, without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This is the beginning of his introduction, or what is called his prologue. Prologue would run you down through verse 18. Uh, what an introduction. When you get done reading this, you say, wow, I want to read the next part of the what he has to say. I want to see who this person is he's talking about. And it's, it's glorious what comes to our attention right at the beginning. Uh, when we ask ourselves, you know, what is a real Christian? In our day and age, you're going to get a lot of different answers. Uh, we're obviously Christians because we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We're Christians because we believe on him as our Savior. We're Christians as those who testify of Christ to our generation. So everything's about Christ. But when I ask you, who is Christ? How would you describe him? Most Christians wouldn't start here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But that's where John starts. He's writing us the gospel. When Mark writes his gospel, he begins with the ministry of Christ. He does not deny Christ's birth or infancy, but he's intent on portraying Christ as the servant of the Lord. And so he starts with the activity, the ministry of Christ. Has a little bit there about John the Baptist, but for the most part, he it, it just jumps into the ministry. When Myth Matthew writes his gospel, he allows that Christ is the servant of the Lord. He doesn't disagree with that. But he also realizes that the Old Testament servants were often leaders. Moses was a judge and a prophet and a leader, as well as the servant of the Lord. And, of course, David was a servant of the Lord. He's called that, and yet he was king. And what Matthew is consumed with is this idea that Christ is the king. And so he starts where? With a genealogy showing that he has a rightful rule in Israel. He has a right to rule. He's a child of Abraham. That's necessary. He's a child of David. And then he goes through his, his uh, gospel, teaching us concerning who this great king is. Luke also gives us a genealogy of Christ. But rather, going back to David and Abraham, such as Matthew did, he traces the genealogy to Adam, all the way back to Adam. Why? 
Well, his theme is that Christ is the Son of Man. And so the way these men begin their Gospels is reflected on what their content is going to be, what they're writing about. For Mark, the servant of the Lord. For Matthew, the great king, the Messiah. For Luke, the Son of Man. And you hear and, and read more about the activity of the Son of Man, for instance, praying, than you do in the other Gospels. Why? He's bringing out these human elements, as it were, to the ministry of Christ. Well, when we get to John, John differs from the others by going further back than Christ's ministry, further back than his infancy when he was born, further back than the genealogy that takes us to Abraham, further back than the genealogy that takes us to Adam. He starts in the beginning, before there was a world, before there was time. And that's where he starts in his, genea in his, in his gospel. John is writing his gospel, obviously under the inspiration of the Spirit, for the purpose of giving an accurate description of the Son of God. That is the theme. He's writing about the Son of God. This description is so that his readers will receive the eternal life that comes with believing on the Son. In the last passage, uh, before you get to what's called the epilogue, in John 20, he gives you the theme as to why he is writing. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might what? That ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye may have life through his name. Right? John very clearly tells you why he's writing. This book ought to help your faith. If you're doubting, come to the book and read it. If you have somebody who's wanting to be saved, take them to the book of John. Make them read the book of John. You have a new convert. I often tell new converts the place to start is John's gospel. Read it through twice before you read anything else. And then start with the other gospels. And then into the epistles. Psalms would be an exception. You could start that. But don't jump into Genesis. You're going to get lost before you get to Leviticus. You won't know what's going on. Start with John's Gospels written to encourage you to believe. And then once you've done that, go through the New Testament and then start through the Old. Great book. Hopefully at the end of this time in our course, your faith will be stronger, not weaker. I'm not here to tear it down. I'm here to build it up. And as we go through the material, hopefully this will translate in that you'll be building up the faith of others in your family, as well as the times you get a chance to minister to God's people. If the Christ we testify of is not the Christ of John's gospel, now that's a question you have to put on your, over what we're saying. If the Christ we're testifying about is not the Christ of John's gospel, then we have to say, are we going to perish? Are the people who are hearing us going to perish? Joshua means Jesus. Joshua is Hebrew, Jehoshua. Jesus is Greek. I have a cousin named Joshua. Yes, he's a nephew named Joshua. If I put my faith in that Joshua, what is going to happen to me? Am I going to perish? He can't save me. It's not a name. It's, a, it's the person behind the name. Well, we have people say, I'm trusting in Jesus. And you start asking him, what is he like? And, and it's nothing like what John has just described. In fact, some of those people are going to tell you they don't believe what John has just described. And in my vineyard, the place where I'm called to labor, there are many who say they are reformed, and they are disagreeing with what John has just described. They don't believe he's the creator. And yet they're going to tell you, we, we, we believe on Jesus Christ, but is he the creator? And they're, they're going to ah, not the way that Genesis says. They come up with some kind of a theistic evolution. Well, the question is, do you have the same Christ that I have? Do you have the same Christ that John had or that Paul had? This becomes very important. The Christ that is being preached in our generation is being changed. And it's being changed to accommodate the unbelief of those who are hearing. 
So we have those who do not hear effectually the Word of God, and because of that, we are now changing the Word of God so they can remain in their unbelief. If John were here, he'd be crossing swords with such people. And we have a, a Christendom in America, and, and mo much of it is evolutionary. We believe in evolution. Well, that's not the same God of the Old Testament. That's not the Christ of the New. So how can you call yourself Christian? In our discipline, our Westminster Confession of Faith, it's very clear in the Shorter Catechism that God created the world in six days. And yet there are Presbyterian ministers in my neck of the woods, in my vineyard, place where I labor, there are Presbyterian ministers who said that's not true. There are millions of years each day. Well, you not only don't believe the scripture, what it says, you think, you think it's fable or, or myth or poetry or whatever, you don't even believe your own confession, which says six days. Spurgeon, who used the London Confession based on the Westminster Confession of Faith, in his catechism when he came to the six days, he made it very clear there were six literal or normal days. Why? Because evolution was coming into full blow. And so he was going to make sure you understood. We have many today who are denying the Christ of John. Well, you've got a different Christ. And that Christ can't help you. He doesn't exist. It's a myth. We are not following cunningly devised fables, to use the language of Peter, we are following what has been revealed about Christ. When you say he is not the creator, you are following a cunningly devised fable. That Christ has never existed. And when you pray, he can't help you. Right? But he might have mercy on you anyways, as he had mercy on Ahab when Ahab prayed one time. But you've got a different Christ, and we have to be careful how we present this Christ. So how does John begin? Well, he begins with the eternality of the Word. To believe in the eternal, eternality of Christ is essential for salvation. It says that in the beginning was the Word. Then in verse 2, a second time, the same was in the beginning with God. Now, only a person who is eternal is going to be able to give you eternal life. And here you have Christ existing in the beginning, that is, in eternity. When everything began, he was already there. The Word was in the beginning. You and I have a beginning. He has no beginning. You and I are drawn into eternity at death, but the Word is from everlasting to everlasting God. We dwell in time and are given eternal life, but the Word dwells in eternity. And I'm talking about things now I do not understand. Things that humble my heart things that make me bow the knee and worship. Just think, he inhabits eternity. You and I inhabit time. Now, we're going to go into eternity. That's coming. But we inhabit time. And this is why sometimes in discussing the mind of God and how God chose and how God predestined and how God foreknew, people are getting in a realm that there's no way possible you can understand the mind of God. The thing that you are supposedly careful of is not changing the data that God gives you about himself. So if God says he predestined, let it leave it alone. He did. You say, well, I don't see how that works in, in time. Well, you may not because you're not God. He dwells in eternity. He is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. You and I, we just had our start sometime here in this 20th century. And now we're in the 21st century. The word has no beginning. That's implied. He was in the beginning of time and all things. We find out later in this same statement, uh, he was the maker of all things in the beginning. Therefore, he was existing before all things he made. I think that's logical. I think John expects you to understand that. Jehovah's Witnesses say he's the first of God's creatures. No, he created all things. 
And so if he created all things, time was created when the world was created. He must be dwelling in eternity. That means several things must be true about him. One, he's self-sufficient because he lived before the world. You and I are not self-sufficient. We're, we're dependent on this world for air, for food, for rest. We're, there's so much we're taking from this world. You go to, the, to Mars as you now are, you die. And you might go in a spaceship with a space suit and with, you know, bring your food with you. But you can't live apart from this world. He lived and made the world. That means he is self-sufficient. This also would imply that he's immutable. We're dealing now with the deity of God, and we know that God changes not. In Malachi, it says, I am Jehovah, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed, because he changes not. He doesn't need anything to exist. You and I change daily. We have changed since we've been in this room. We've gotten older. I've probably had a few more hairs fall out. I mean, those are things that happen. We change. He does not change. So that immediately, John says, in the beginning, he's taking you to a realm you can't completely understand, so quit trying to explain it in a way that people can completely understand it. We do what John does. We just declare it. We, we explain the data as to saying he was in the beginning, therefore these are the things that must be true of him. But I can't bring that down into your mind that you can fully comprehend what that is because you and I have never dwelt in eternity. We're not God. We've never been self-sufficient. We can dream about what it might be like, but our dreams can only go so far, and then we have to pull back and say, I don't know. I don't understand. Second thing he says <clears throat> was that the word was with God. The preposition with is the preposition pros. Pros, are you familiar with that preposition? Let me see if I can get this to work. Pros, actually at the end of the word there would be a sigma like that. There's another preposition, soon, but he didn't use soon. He used pros. One theologian, and you'll see this a little bit later, says this has the idea of being face-to-face -face with someone. Not soon in the sense that you're incorporated into something, but face-to-face. -face. The word pros means to or toward. He was with God. He was facing God. Now, who existed at that time? Angels didn't exist. He hadn't created them yet. And so the only thing that exists is God. And the question you have then, are there one or two gods? Here are two distinct persons. The Logos, the Word, which is face-to-face -face with God. When we note that there's but one God, and that He is God, then we realize that we're dealing with two persons in the Godhead. There is one God. The Word is the second person of the Godhead. He is distinct from the first person of the Godhead, yet he is equal with that person because he is God. There is more than one person in the Godhead. At this point in John's writing, because he's writing about the Logos, he is not telling you the full data, the full knowledge, the full doctrine of the Trinity. But later we find that indeed the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. Right now you have the only begotten of the Father being made known to us in the prologue of John's writing. The first and second person of the Godhead are there. Later that revelation clearly reveals the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, especially when you get in the upper room discourse. But really you can't get out of chapter 1 without getting much of the Spirit's ministry told to you. So, in the beginning, there are two distinct persons, and they're face to face. They're distinct. They're not the same. Then we find that the Word was God. He has the name of God. He's called God. 
unlike what the Jehovah's Witnesses want to make, a, a big God with a G and a little God with a G. The one is created, the other is not. There's no such thing in, in, the, in the New Testament. He was God. And so now we have another mystery. He's face to face with God, but he is God. That's what the Trinity is. Three distinct persons in the Godhead, and yet one God. Holy Spirit's God. Jesus Christ is God. The Father is God. Three persons, but one God. Can I explain that to the point that you can fully comprehend it? No more than I can explain eternity. Infinite time, as it were. I can't explain either one. I can tell you the data as to what we're talking about. Back in the days of the Reformation, there was one of the men who tried to explain it in terms of, I think, three candles. You're in a dark room. You have three candles, uh, each candle giving light, but there's one light. Where does the, the, if you're just looking at light, not so much the candles, but at light, where does the light from one candle begin and the light from another candle end? We, you can't. It's just one entity, as it were. And yet even with that, that's not a perfect illustration. There, there is nothing really that we have in this world that is a perfect illustration. And yet when you come to apologetics, have you had apologetics yet? The one and the many? Uh, that's based to some extent on this mystery of the Godhead. Right? He was God. He has the name of God. When you begin looking at what is said, he has the attributes of God. He's in the beginning, therefore he's eternal. That's only an attribute of God. Angels are not eternal. They have their beginning. You're not eternal. You have your beginning. Now, you'll last for eternity in heaven or hell. You will be here forever, but you are not eternal in that you're from everlasting to everlasting. But this one is, he has the attribute of God. He has the attitude of God. We see that he, he was sent because the Father loved sinners and he himself came and died for those sinners that's not reflected here in these first verses but the action of god is reflected he created the world he's very bold john is he, he just wasn't as it were a, a, a creation and then ma he made all things he made it all and so when you go back to genesis chapter one in the beginning god created john has his own little commentary on that in the beginning and before he says god he says the word was with god the word was god the same was in the beginning with god all things were made by him and so you have then a very clear statement that he is god and you have in conjunction with the name god an attribute of God, he's eternal. You have an action of God. Here in these first verses, he creates all things. John is not making a mistake here. He's trying to make it very clear that we understand he is God. So we know that he's eternal. We know that he's God and yet distinct from God in the sense that he's a distinct person in the Godhead. And then we have the very name given to him. He's called the Word, the Word. Uh, the Word is Logos. There are other terms in the New Testament for Word, Harema. Some have said that Harema has the idea of a distinct Word where Logos would be a discourse, a, a speech, a, a dissertation. When God wants to speak to you, how does he do it? Well, when you want to speak to someone, how do you do it? You do it with words, not just with one word, but many words. You're giving a discourse, and you're revealing yourself through your words. I don't know what's in your heart. I can't see it. The only thing I can see are your actions, and I might misunderstand those, and what you express with your words. And unless you lie to me, then, then what your words are are a clear reflection of what's in your heart. When God wants to reveal himself to this world, he does it through the second person of the Godhead, the Logos. And so he's called the Word. Or you could say he's called the revelation of God. 
Or, as, as one commentator said, I was thinking it was Calvin, but strike that. I don't want to put that in Calvin's speech. Uh, but he's the speech of God. He is God's revelation to us. I believe then when you go to the Old Testament, you see the angel of the Lord, and it's clear that the angel of the Lord is deity, that you're looking at a manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ, because he is the Logos. I realize there's those who would disagree with that. I think they're wrong. <laughs> you may disagree with that. You have a right to be wrong. <laughs> he is God's revelation. The name communicates a message. The name is used four times in this first chapter of the Son of God. Three times here, and then once in verse 14. Very important in verse 14, because it says the Word was made flesh. And we'll get to that. But here, it's all connected with his deity. Now, John uses this word again in the book of the Revelation, which I'm trying to stay out of. All right? But you have the Word coming back, and you have this emblazoned on him. He is the word of God. And then you have in 1 John chapter 1, he combines, he seems to combine the very things that he's talking about in these first few verses where it says that, uh, that he is life. And so he calls him the word of life in 1 John chapter 1. The word of life was manifested. And so we have here then this idea, I don't know how to get out of this mode. There we go. That John begins by giving you the name that is going to identify that he is the one revealing God to men. Uh, you have the two passages quoted here in First John, the Word of Life, as well as Revelation 19. He is called the Word of God. Uh, that is how he is returning. He is the revelation of God. Now, when you ask yourself, what does it reveal about God? And you come into the Gospel. Well, in chapter 1, he's the Lamb of God. This certainly teaches us something about God's holiness and the need for atonement. It teaches us something about atonement and sin. So he is God's revelation there as to atonement. You come to chapter 6, and he is the bread of life. Right? And that teaches you something about your need and, and your feasting. You, you come to chapter 8, he's the light of the world. You come to chapter 10, he's the door into the sheepfold. You come to chapter 10, and he is the shepherd of those sheep who have come into the sheepfold. When you come to chapter 11, he is life over death. He is the resurrection and the life. Chapter 14, he is the entrance unto God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You come to chapter 15, he is the vine. And we are branches attached to him and receive sustenance from him. There are other allusions in John's Gospel. He's the ladder, chapter 1. He's the brazen serpent, chapter 3. He's the water of life, chapter 4. He is the rock. That gives water, chapter 7. He is God's revelation to us. In so many ways, these, these areas that I am speaking about have to do with man's relationship with God, and you cannot have a relationship with God apart from knowing these things about Christ. You may know a few things and have a beginning of a relationship, but a full-blown relationship is going to take in all these things that I have mentioned. Even if you don't know the names, you will know Christ in these different realms. We could also say he's the revelation of the Trinity. Now, he is not the Trinity, but you learn of the Father-Son relationship where? In the New Testament. And who is the one that expresses that most? It is John where the Father and Son are speaking, where the Son is praying. So much is said about this relationship between the Father and the Son, and then the sending of the Spirit. The provision of the Spirit is tied right into the Father and Son. It is Christ who is revealing to us, as it were, the great Trinity. Now, the Trinity is in the Old Testament, especially 
that the fact that there are distinct persons in the Godhead, God said, let us make man in our image, right? In the very first chapter, we see a plurality of persons in the Godhead. We don't know how many, but we know there's more than one. Let us make man in our image. Same thing is written in Isaiah chapter 6. Who will go for us? Right? So we know there's more, one person, more than one person in the Godhead. But you come to the New Testament, this is being revealed. This is being, as it were, clearly explained. When you come to the Gospels, and especially in this Gospel. How does the Word express himself? Well, he expresses himself as the creator of the world. Matter, earth, is not eternal. It is not eternal. The world was created by the Word, and nothing was made without the Word. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God does not explain his being or actions in Genesis. He just declares it to us. And what we have here is the same thing in John. The word is not explaining his actions. It's just being declared to us. John says, in the beginning, he created all things. Now, you said, I can't figure that all out scientifically. Well, you weren't there. And, and nobody who talks to you about those days was there. So you're either going to trust the man who was not there telling you what was like then, or you're going to go to someone who was there, and that is God himself. And God is saying, this is how it started. Who do I trust? Fallible man? Depraved man? Lying man? Or do I trust the God who cannot lie, who understands everything clearly, and gives me his statement as to how the world began? I'm going to trust him. And when we come to trying to understand how the world began, we find that Christ, that is the Word of God, the Son of God, was the one who created all things. Now, the Trinity was involved in creation, but he was the one doing the work. The Apostle John confesses Christ created all things. The Apostle Paul confesses the Son created all things. They both confess that the Son created all things. In Colossians chapter 1, it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. It's as if Paul is writing a commentary on John, and yet John wrote his later. He was before all things. He was in the beginning. He created all things. He says it twice, just like John did. Right? All things were made by him, and then we learn something else. They were made for him. What is your purpose of being on this earth? It's for him. We lose sight of that every day. It's for me. <laughs> That's why I'm here. And my wife and my children, they're here to help me, and the world is here to help me. And Obama's here to help me. <laughs> Strike that if it, four years from now, he's not on the throne anymore, uh, president. But we, we view the world that way how often? You know, I mean, how often is that's the case? We're viewing the world, it's all for me. And the Bible says, no, it's for the one who made you, the creator. A and the son made all things. All things is stated twice. To get around that, the Jehovah's Witness who say that Christ was the first of all creation, put the word other in here. All other things were created. And they put it in brackets. And I had a Jehovah's Witness. I said, show me your New World Translation. And he did. I, I said, you see the word other there? That, they put it in brackets because it it's not supposed to be there. You got a pen? Let me, let me strike through that for you and show you what it really says. Read it as it really is. All things were created by him. Meaning, if all things were created by him, he himself was not created. Exactly what John says at the beginning of his gospel. So we have then this Christ as being the one who made all things. And when you say that you believe that the Word, the Son, Christ, created all things. You've just put yourself in the line of fire from the evolutionists, from some Presbyterians, 
even from other so-called Christians. John Paul II said he believed in a theistic evolution. You're just out of line with this world. You're out of step. But you know what else? You're correct. That's how the world came into being. God did it this way. And I thank the Lord for those scientists who are Christians, truly Christians, who have gone to science and are interpreting it to fit the scriptures rather than trying to interpret the scriptures to fit the evolutionary theory of men. And that's all it is, is a theory. And it's a theory really devised to attack scripture. That's the reason it's been written that way, to attack scripture. So why would I let someone who wrote to attack scripture twist the facts of science and then make me believe those facts in that fashion? I'm very happy for men like Henry Morris and John Wickham in their book, The Genesis Flood, or, or the other new men today who are writing and doing great things like Ken Ham and defending the Genesis Flood uh, and defending the, the creation account in Genesis. Well, we'll stop here and then we'll come to the next point where the word expresses himself as the life for sinners. He not only expresses himself as the creator of the world, but he also expresses himself as the life for men. And we'll look at that in our next uh, lecture.